Struggling as a kid with poor parents is very different from struggling as a kid with wealthy parents. The truth is, you're going to struggle either way. But if you have wealthy parents, you get to choose your struggle. So you might as well choose the one that's going to benefit you now and in your future instead of waiting and kicking that can down the road. I'm attorney Ali Awad, the CEO lawyer. Today I'm gonna to talk about how I grew up as a hustler, as a young kid on the streets of Fifth Avenue, how I built this incredible work ethic over the years, and my fears of how my son and my future children may not have that same type of work ethic. So on today's episode of the CEO Lawyer Podcast, we're gonna get deep and personal, baby. Let's go. So my sister was actually asking me this question before the show and said, hey, um, I'm thinking for myself and I'm watching my brothers and their children and learning from the mistakes that you guys are going to make so I don't make those same mistakes with my future children. And I thought about it because I actually do the same thing now. I waited until I was 27 to get married and it sounds like I'm waiting a long time, but when it's compared to my three brothers who all got married at age 23, it seems like I was just a late bloomer. But in reality, I was watching all of them go through the engagement process, the wedding process, honeymoon, anniversary, having kids, and I learned so much from experiencing through their mistakes. And one thing I found out was that having money, or at least access to money when you're married, solves a lot of problems. When you're broke and you're trying to get married, there's only so much that love can do. At some point, we gotta eat, we gotta have a place to stay, and we want safety and we want security, and that costs money. And if you want to start a family, it costs even more. So I waited until I actually had a successful business and I knew that I could afford to get married, start a family, get a, a decent place to stay, and cover all of these expenses. But I want to talk about how I grew up as a kid and how leading up to before I got married, before I had my, my own child, the struggles that I went through. And the truth is, we grew up very, very poor. Uh, it was normal for the lights to get cut off or the water to get cut off. It didn't happen all the time, but it was very normal to have cockroaches in the house because no matter what kind of spray that we used, these cockroaches always seemed to come back. Um, we lived in the hood on Fifth Avenue in an old school 1960 built brick home that my dad bought on a deal that was owner financed. And it was normal to hear gunshots when we were going to the mosque and praying. It was normal to ride the bus to school. I don't think there's anything wrong with it even to this day. Uh, free lunches, the works, you know. But we didn't get the government benefits because my parents weren't citizens. So imagine being broke and not having any sort of government assistance. That was kind of the worst of both worlds. At least the people that were American citizens and their kids were American citizens, they got those benefits. So it was a little bit easier. But for us, at a young age, myself and my brothers, we really had to hustle and struggle from an early age. My first business that I ever started was at age five when I was selling pictures of Dragon Ball Z characters to elementary school students. My dad was an engineer and he had this color printer at home. And so when he would do his AutoCAD drawings, you know, during the day for his work, you know, in the afternoon when he's no longer using the work computer, I can go up on the computer and start playing on the internet. And back at that time, 1995, there wasn't much information and content on the internet. So I would literally type in Dragon Ball Z on, it was Yahoo at that time, we weren't using Google. And you go to yahoo.com slash images dash Dragon Ball Z, and you'd get like seven results. And every day you'd keep searching online to see if anyone uploaded more photos. And so I would go and print off those pictures, and I would cut the URL off the bottom of the page when I printed it off so no one knew my source. So in 1995, these kids had no idea where I was getting these photos. They were just thinking, oh, I see Dragon Ball Z characters on my tube television at home, and this is like having access to these awesome characters. So it was honestly the first time I started doing business, I realized how I could leverage and use that knowledge arbitrage of knowing where to get something where other people couldn't get it. And I feel like that's just been the theme of my entire life, is just knowledge arbitrage. I know something that you don't and you need to pay me for it. And as time went on, that knowledge arbitrage developed where when I started selling Yu-Gi-Oh cards, I knew where to trade and get those cards. I'd go to Walnut Square Mall and they'd have these little 
Yu-Gi-Oh trading events where you can meet with these kids that would have all these decks, they have rich parents, and they would have thousands of these cards, and they might not know the value of all those cards, but you know how to trade with them and buy from them and sometimes finesse them out of giving you some of their better cards. And that's how at age eight, I made my first $100 selling the five Yu-Gi-Oh cards of Exodia to this kid named Lionel Reynoso. I'll never forget that. When I made that $100, it was like during fifth period, I held on to that $100 bill and put my hand in my pocket. And my hand stayed crumbling that $100 bill in my pocket from the fifth period all the way to the end of the day, all the way onto the bus ride home, all the way until I got into the house. And I finally took my hand out of my pocket. Why? Because my younger brother, Sam, for Aid one year, he put his money inside his sock. He thought that was the safest place to put his money. And when we went to Walmart to celebrate, because that's what poor people do is they celebrate at Walmart, um, he was looking through his socks and he realized he lost the money. And so uh, I did not want that to happen to me. So I held on to that $100 bill like it was my entire life savings. And it really was. It was more than my life savings because I actually was in business with my younger brother, Sam. And I think I made $60 and he made 40. And I had to give that 100 to my mom to break that 100 and give us some 20s. I think she charged us like a 20% commission. Bottom line is we were all hustlers. So age eight, made my first $100. Age nine, I started my first eBay store. I started selling things on eBay. By age 11, I was selling electronics online pretty regularly. By 13, started getting pretty good at online sales. I was going to these auction sites. There was one auction site called ubid.com where I would buy kicker L7 subwoofers. I would buy um, refurbished amplifiers. I would buy TVs that would go get installed in cars and I would resell them on eBay or inside the retail store with my brothers. And that's just, that's what I did. I was always hustling and figuring out ways to sell things. There was a period where I would sell air purifiers online. There was a period where I would sell these uh, portable welders. Uh, there was a period where I sold a bunch of polo shirts. I think I bought like a thousand shirts online wholesale and then I would just resell them literally from the trunk of my car in high school. I started a wholesale uh, car audio business that only lasted about six months before I got ripped off for $25,000. Check out the other podcast and learn about that story. It was just a lot. I had a graphic design company for about seven years during that time where I would make stickers and install them on people's cars. That was, that's a great business, by the way. If you're looking for a way to make easy money, here's a quick tip. If you want an awesome business where you can make quick money from day one, I recommend buying a vinyl plotter online. When I was 13 years old, I bought a Master XY300 vinyl plotter. It was a 32 inch machine. It was $700 at that time. It was literally my entire life savings. And I bought some 24 inch vinyl rolls. They were 50 yards long. It was basically an entire sheet of stickers. I would get this program online and create all of these different designs for stickers that I would then sell. Think about every time you drive and you see a car that has these stick figures of like the family, the dad, the mom, the two kids, and the dog. Or you see someone that has their initials on their back glass. Or you see someone with a logo. Or you see someone with a famous verse, right? All of those are stickers. They're vinyl stickers. And the beautiful thing about the vinyl business is that you can actually sell the product before you even make it. So you can just show people the designs, post them on Etsy, post them on eBay, post them on Amazon, post them on Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. Show them all the different designs that you can make. Sell those stickers and shipping is always just 50 cents because it's literally a piece of a sticker inside an envelope that you can mail all over the US. Check out the vinyl plotter business. It's the easiest way to make money today. So the graphic design business was basically running for like seven years before I hired this guy named Cam that basically took my computer and he said he was a software engineer. He deleted all of my files. I could never recoup them because he reformatted the hard drive on the computer. So I decided to stop working in that business at that point. Uh, in college, I was selling car audio again. I opened up a retail store inside the mall, in Town Center Mall. I also um, was buying and selling cars. Uh, in law school, I bought an apartment complex that I thought I was gonna be a real estate investor. I worked a couple of different legal jobs. And then finally, after I graduated law school, I left all of that behind. I cut off every single business that I'd ever done and decided to go all in on personal injury. I didn't take any other type of case and I just focused on my business. And five years later, I'm running a eight figure business that regularly does one or $2 million a month in attorney's fees. And it's kind of surreal. So what happens if you 
want to have this kind of work ethic. You want to be a hustler. You want to grow and have all these incredible skills and make sure that you're in the NBA, right? The never broke again club. And you don't have the opportunity to hustle, start online businesses or whatever. First of all, if you're seeing this content on YouTube, on your computer, on your phone, on Instagram, wherever, you already have access to the technology that you need to start making money. The vinyl plotter business where you basically buy a machine that cuts stickers and designs stickers and you being able to sell them online, probably one of the best businesses that you can make with very little investment. For a couple hundred bucks, you can literally start this business and most of the time you can charge uh, people just with cash or with PayPal or with Venmo, Cash App, whatever. You can set up an LLC online for free. It's super, super easy. So what if you don't need to hustle? What if your parents are rich? What if, what if you know that your parents are going to take care of you forever? You basically have, you live in an awesome home. Your parents have nice cars. You always have brand new clothes and you never really have to worry about that. But you're still passionate about building something for yourself. Let me tell you this. One of my biggest fears is that my son is going to grow up with a silver spoon in his mouth and not have any sort of humility or work ethic. The humility, I think I can teach him. The work ethic, it's just one of those things where you can't teach hungry. And my biggest struggle, now that I'm, I'm 31 years old and I've built a multi-million dollar business and I get to basically buy and do whatever I want, my struggle is that I have to limit the amount of expenses and luxury purchases and dream vacations and really living a lavish lifestyle because I don't want my son to think it comes automatically. Let me rephrase that. I have to limit my lifestyle because I don't want my son to think that all this comes easily. So if I really wanted to go and buy a new exotic car every month, I could do it. If I wanted to go and just vacation for the rest of the year, I could do it. If I, if I wanted to cash out and retire right now and not have to do anything for the rest of my life, I could do it. But what is that gonna do to my son? Well, first, what's it gonna do to my mental health? I'll probably go crazy. But what's it gonna do to my son? Is he gonna have the same work ethic that I have? Is he gonna grow up feeling like everything that, that's around him he's earned? And so this, there's a struggle that's happening for me and a struggle that's gonna happen for kids that grow up with parents that essentially can afford to give them whatever they, they want. My struggle is that I have to learn how to say no. If you are lucky enough where God has blessed you to the point where you can give your kids and your family anything that they want and your friends anything that they could possibly imagine, you have to learn to say no. And it's for their own good. If 80% of the time the answer is no, when you do say yes, they're gonna feel excited. They're gonna feel like this is an opportunity. But if 80% of the time you say yes, the moments you say no, they're gonna have a tantrum. They're gonna go crazy. So you have to train yourself to say no to your kids, to your family, to your friends, because you, by saying no to others, you're saying yes to yourself. And by saying no to, your, to yourself, you're saying yes to future generations. So if I say, no, I don't want to go buy that exotic car. No, I don't want to have that lavish vacation. No, I don't want to spend unnecessarily on this thing. I'm saying yes to my son realizing, hey, we're working for all of this. When I'm actually putting in work every single day and he's seeing me work, he's seeing me exercise, he's seeing me better myself consistently, he knows that this is part of the process. The work is unavoidable. The struggle is unavoidable. And for you kids that have the opportunity to do whatever you want, pick your struggle. You can choose to struggle now or you can choose to struggle later. If you struggle now and you decide to not accept any money from your family, to not accept any money from your parents, you don't need that allowance, you're going to pay your own cell phone bill, you're going to go out and work even if it's just a, a, a regular hourly job at a restaurant as a cashier, grocery store attendant, whatever it is, start an online business, start some sort of side hustle, learn to say no to your parents and learn to not take any money that you didn't earn. 
The beautiful thing is that you always have a fallback. If it fails, you still live in a comfy home, you still have a roof over your head, you're still gonna have a meal for you. But you have to, as early as possible, you have to learn how to make money on your own, as early as possible. And you have to understand that meals cost money, that the roof over your head costs money, that your cell phone costs money, that your Netflix subscription costs money. And then you have to calculate how much would I need to make in order to just replace the lifestyle that I currently have as a kid under my family's roof to do on my own? It's a lot of money. It's way more than you would think. And so if you can train yourself to at least start making enough money to be able to be self-sufficient and self-reliant, but then have the ability to save and the foresight to not spend any of that money and just save and stack as much cash as possible to go on the offense, that's when you've won. Because you win both ways, really. You win because you learn the skills of learning how to hustle and live below your means. And two, because you're living below your means, you're still living with your parents and you're saving up that money, you're gonna have opportunities that open up for you in the future and you're really going to pay attention how you invest that money because you earned every single dollar. So I'm a huge proponent of living with your parents for as long as possible to stack up that money, but don't be chilling and playing video games all day and wasting your life away. Go out there and work, go out there and hustle, go out there and start a new business, make some mistakes and understand you have this beautiful fallback. Because if you learn those skills early on, it's gonna save you from having to suffer through those skills in the future. So pick that struggle now. It's a little uncomfortable, it's a little unexciting, but it's going to pay you multiple dividends in the future. And for those parents out there that did grow up with incredible work ethic and were hungry, my advice to you is this. Learn to say no to your kids and understand that everything that they see is their norm. It's normal for them to have lights at the flick of a button, at fresh food, fruits, vegetables, the best meats, the best restaurants, the best cars, the best lifestyle, that's their norm. So they can't possibly fathom where you came from. Like, I can't fathom where my dad came from. He grew up in, in the refugee camps in Lebanon, in Shatila. Like, what? I, I can't even imagine growing up in a refugee camp. And that's his norm. And I think I grew up poor. And he's like, man, y'all had everything. Because I remember he, he, it's, I remember my dad making it such a big deal that we got this black and white Game Boy for $20 from the flea market. And he's like, man, y'all are so pampered. Because my brother and I, my younger brother and I had to share a Game Boy, a $20 Game Boy that we bought. If, you're, if you didn't grow up in the 80s or 90s, you don't even know what a Game Boy is. It sounds perverted, right? <laughs> but seriously, the... The lifestyle that I had growing up is so much different from the lifestyle that I have now. And so I have to impart that kind of struggle onto my son. And I think one of the greatest things that my dad ever did was tell me no all the time, even though he had the ability to say yes some of the time. I can say yes all of the time to my son. And my struggle is that I have to learn to say no for his own benefit. So I hope that this podcast has shed some light on how you can maintain that strong work ethic if you're a young kid living with parents that have access and the ability to give you everything, or if you're a parent and you wanna impart that type of work ethic onto your own children. My kid is only one right now, so I can't tell you what it's going to be like, but I'm already planning the things that I need to do and the moves that I need to make in order for him to appreciate everything that's in his life right now. And sometimes we have to create struggle in our lives and for people just to remember that all of this can be gone just like that and to appreciate what we have. I'm attorney Ali Awad, the CEO lawyer. Thank you for tuning in on this podcast and we'll see you on the next one.